Good morning. Bright and early. We are up and out of the house before we typically would be awake. We have an appointment this morning for an ultrasound and blood work and a physical to make sure that everything is ready for me to start IVF meds tomorrow. So we just finished our suppression phase where everything is like calmed down and then tomorrow we would start our stim phase where we ramp everything up. So fingers crossed that everything today looks good. We knew that it would be intensive for Hannah, but the first internal ultrasound was terrifying for her. Yeah. And for me because she was terrified. It is super dark in our ultrasound room. I'm gonna fall asleep. Ready for my ultrasound. I think it was a lot easier than we expected it to be. At that point, we were like, wow, we're doing an amazing job. Like, this is going fantastic. Yes, we did the ultrasound, the blood work, the physical. Then we went to get breakfast. <laughs> as soon as I got up from my ultrasound, I was like, uh, Shane, my back is like really hurting. I haven't had a back, like I used to have really bad back issues and I haven't had a back ache in a long time. So that's the bad news. Yeah. Is that Hannah's back is thrown out. So now that's why I'm laying in bed like this. <laughs> like, ow. <laughs> the good news is that everything is, you know. Yeah. Out of cast everything is good. They already called um, with the results. Everything looked good to go. So that means that I start my first injections tomorrow. So tomorrow will be day one. Right. I should be on them for about 10 days and then we do egg retrieval. So it's not that long of a process. You're going to get there. It's yeah. It's going to be good. I'm excited. Oh boy. Hannah was in great spirits. I was doing up, like I had been doing research. Hannah had been telling me that her mood might be all over the place. Yeah. You know, I was prepared. <laughs> to be hiding from <laughs> Hannah at all times. All right, first official stimulation injection is underway. And this is the second injection overall. Yes. She had a two day break. I did. From injections. And now we begin the real. Now we begin the real real. Twice a day injections. Near the end, it got harder for you, I would say. Yeah, more, like more uncomfortable. More uncomfortable. Yeah. Here comes Shane trying to get in the frame. Hi, I'm involved. You're involved. So we are currently on day 11 of stims. Which is pretty high. Yep, they told me I would probably be doing like eight or nine days, but it can go up to like 12. Day 11, everybody. Everything had been good so far. So I did the ultrasound, I did the blood draw, and then we just waited a couple hours for my nurse to call to let us know, like, yes, we're done. Tonight is the trigger. Like, you're going to come in for your egg retrieval in two days. Like, we're good to go. And we were really hopeful that it would be that day. Terrible angle, but... Do you see me? Yeah, you can see. You're blurry in the back. <laughs> it's uh, the last injection before the egg retrieval tomorrow morning. It's egg retrieval eve. Egg retrieval eve. This is my final trigger shot. One of my favorite holidays. Uh, my third trigger shot. Done. Done. <laughs> All right. Good job. This little girl comforting me. Hi. She my buddy. <laughs> okay. They just know. You know? So after our first round of IVF didn't result in any embryos, we did make the decision to jump into another round. Our doctor was really um, interested in exploring a different medication protocol and felt that she could have success with us. And she was correct. Um, our second round, all of our eggs were mature, created embryos, and 70% of them came back genetically normal. So suddenly we were in the game and we had something to play mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And that is kind of when she approached us about this idea that she was feeling after seeing me so many times that she had some serious concerns about whether it was safe for me to carry a child and more specifically related to the placement of my kidney. So I did go see a urology specialist who also confirmed that the placement of my kidney 
could present serious health complications. So when weighing the cost benefits of trying, it didn't seem like a risk that any of either, neither of us or our, our care team felt comfortable with us pursuing. So at that point, surrogacy was suggested. It was something that I felt given our situation was the only safe way to now bring these precious embryos here. And so it became very quickly just about finding the right person to go on this journey with. Getting ready to go to a neighborhood block party today, which I think is very brave of me. Um, our neighborhood has historically had a neighborhood block party and we never go because it's filled with children and we are like the only people on the block that don't have children. So that's why, but we're going to brave it today for the first time ever. So wish us luck. 12th of July weekend. Yeah. Not doing our normal thing because too many friends just had babies and it's a little triggering. So we're just going to hang out in the in the neighborhood with all the families that we also never hang out with because we don't have kids. <laughs> no, we have a good neighborhood. Morning! Or afternoon or whatever. Whatever time it is. But there was certainly a, another period of learning that had to happen, right? Yeah. We had, it felt like we just were continually learning more and more. more and more and the weight of taking all that knowledge was pretty substantial for us both right? yeah it felt like okay now we just learned everything about ivf and everything about infertility and now we're being told we have to go and look at a different solution that is also connected to this solution but there's a whole world of complexity around that yeah and that was something that we embraced the challenge of but it felt overwhelming we didn't have a good frame of reference for for surrogacy no. either. We had no concept of of why this was necessary. It, it was very different than the the IVF community. At this point, I had started an uh, an account on social media um, to find more support, and so I we had a really good grasp at that point on on IVF. But at that point, surrogacy really wasn't part of that community. It really wasn't discussed. If you found any information about it, it was usually from the surrogate perspective, not from the intended parent perspective. And so there weren't a whole lot of resources for us at that time. It's changed so much in the last three years. It was kind of presented to us in a way that was a fix as well, just like IVF was, that, oh, if you do this, then this will happen for you. And it was the same thing of, oh, if you give up on your body and let somebody else take the reins, like, then you will have a baby. And we're here three years later and several surrogates into this and we have no baby. So our original plan for our fertility journey was I was going to carry. That's kind of what we we just decided. Like, like agreed upon. Yeah, yeah, we agreed upon. It was just like okay, I'll I'll go first this time. Um, so we started. Well, actually, you were gonna carry both of them. I was. was she yeah. really wanted to. I really have wanted that, like, that experience. Motherly, yeah. Experience of pregnancy. That was experience. Yeah, because I was like, all right, if I'm gonna have kids, I want to. I want the full experience. I want to know what it feels like to be pregnant. So I had no desire <laughs> yeah. to, to do that. Um, I was like, I'll do whatever you want. I'll cook. I'll clean. I'll clean a litter box. You'll be, you'll be pregnant and I'll take care of it all. When we first went to the fertility clinic, we met with our, our doctor and she was wonderful. She's going to be the same one who's you know going to stay on our journey with us. And she brought up my labs and she looked at them and she was – kind of taken back because she was like okay these specific labs aren't really adding up to how young you are and your weight and how healthy you are and essentially she said that I p had PCOS and 
both her and my OBGYN were concerned about, you know, how high the levels were and that there would be a very great chance of miscarriage or more, you know, a harder time conceiving. And when you're thinking about IUI and you're thinking about IVF, like it's it's not a cheap route to take. So our fertility doctor was very honest with us and she she even said that IVF would probably be better to jump into first because of PCOS. We both were kind of like, I don't think that's financially doable for us. I don't think, I mean, of course we want to start a family. Of course we'll do anything we can, but then we also don't want it to break us as a, as a couple. So that really brought us back to the, you know, to the drawing board again. And again, of just feeling like, wow, this, I had no idea that this was something I was going to struggle with. And I hadn't heard much about, about PCOS in general. I didn't know many women who had gone through it. So I just felt really alone and I felt really confused and upset that, you know, our fertility doctor was like, this just, this is a risk factor I'm not willing to take with you for, with IUI. This is something that would be a better call for IVF. Yeah, I remember when we first found out um, that Sarah couldn't carry anymore. She was very devastated. I, in a way, was devastated as well because, as I said before, I am definitely a planner, but I'm spontaneous. But it took me a little time to get back to that, okay, now we're shifting plans. So that's why we kind of had to stop things for a little bit, go back to the drawing board, and then come up with plan B. And I remember we were sitting, I think we were upstairs in our room, and we were just like sitting across from each other in bed just being like what are our options like you know I think we both felt confused we both felt devastated and I just remember we were just like looking at each other and and then that's kind of when you were like okay maybe this is something that I can do yeah so I we had to kind of take that break for a little bit and then um we just ended up recollecting and, and, and saying this isn't the end of the world. Right, it's not the end of the world. Most, I mean, at least a straight couple yeah. <laughs> doesn't pick and choose who gets the carrier, who doesn't. Right. So um, the more we thought about it and the more that we got on board with it, I just started getting very excited. I feel so lucky that I have a partner that <laughs> that would do so much for me. Um because obviously, like, we want to have a baby and we want to have a family. And she was never like, I'm not going to, you know, help. I'm not going to help. I'm not going to carry. I'm just not going to do that. She just needed some time to think about it. And she immediately was on board. She was like, all right, I'll do this. I'll do this for us right now. And that was the biggest sacrifice and the most selfless act anyone could ever, ever commit I think like to be able to take that on knowing that I couldn't um so then we totally switched gears and we were like all right let's start all over (laughs) with with Cindy I definitely feel like the second time around, we're not veterans or anything, but we definitely feel like we have more knowledge on IVF, what the process will be like. I knew nothing about the IVF process prior to it. Um, I didn't know what the success rate was or anything like that. I kind of assumed it was just like a procedure and 90% success rate or something like that. Agreed. Um, I just thought it would be the, the next thing that's a sure thing. Um, I also thought it would be a lot quicker. I didn't think it would be as emotional mm-hmm. or as trying. I didn't think there would be so many appointments. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I don't think we even really spoke about anything IVF related to anyone, not yeah. our family, not our friends. We kind of just went through the motions together since we were going through the losses and everything. We just kind of wanted to keep keep this one thing to ourselves, kind of figure it out on our own. And once we felt felt more comfortable, um, tell our family and friends about it on our own time, yeah. And because we had success the first time we did IVF um, 
to get our daughter. We thought that we would have a success very quickly the second time. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Since we already have embryos, we're not going through the complete IVF process again. It's just the IVF transfer. Between our daughter and this time, we had two losses. So, and for those, those um, pregnancies, I did try a lot. I tried eating healthier um, and, you know, doing whatever I could to try to facilitate a positive pregnancy. And when it, you know, it didn't work, I was just like, forget it. The third time, I'm just gonna use our tested embryo and hope for the best. I just remember that they all kind of begin the same way. We go and get the transfer and then we wait like a week or two mm -hmm. and see how things are going. And there was a lot of pregnancy tests. We never know when to take a pregnancy test. I think sometimes they're taken a little bit early, try to get an idea of how things are going. But once we get a definitive answer, it's it wasn't what we wanted. And That's from there, it was just preparing for the the inevitable next round. So the waiting during the two week wait is the absolute, was one of the worst waits there is. I try to distract myself as much as possible. I try to eat the foods I love the most while I can. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just whatever I can do to get my mind off of it. A lot of the times it doesn't work and that's why I usually take a pregnancy test early. Um, but then that's one of the things that keeps me going throughout that second week. It just, that's something I look forward to personally. I take a test every day and no matter what it says, at least I know that's something that I can look forward to and it helps the day go by a little bit faster. I'm mostly just dealing with her stressing, <laughs> stressing for two weeks and doing a countdown every day of this is where we're at. She's like, one more day. Does this line look darker? You know. For my third transfer, I felt absolutely nothing. So I was so sure that it failed. Then went to the doctor's office two days later and I was like sobbing. I was like, I think this failed. Like, I don't want to take my shots anymore. Like. I'm so over it, I wanna take a break. He's like, it's way too early to tell. Give it a couple more days um, and we'll see like after we take the blood test. Um, lo and behold, when we took the blood test, it was positive. And then we went in two days later for another test. It was positive, more positive. Um, and then we went in two days later and it was, my numbers were through the roof. Yes, I am pregnant now. <laughs> I surprised him by putting the pregnancy test in a bowl in the kitchen. So when he came home early from work, I think I asked him to come home early from work that day because I was frantic and I couldn't hold it in anymore. So I put it in the um, I put it in a bowl in the kitchen and I asked him for help making cereal or something silly. I was really excited. I was very happy one because now we're having our second kid, but two that this time it works because. I go mostly off of how Sharday feels. And when she was saying, I don't think this one worked, I'm trusting her. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of prepping myself for this round didn't work. We're going to move on to the next round. So I was, I think, shocked <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that it was successful. Yeah, me too. But very happy. Oh, good. <laughs> next time on Fertility Out Loud. We also think every little thing that might be normal could be <laughs> potentially the start of something bad. Right. If she feels like a slight cramp for even a minute, we're like, is that a good thing? Is that something we need to call a doctor about? Right. It's difficult mm -hmm. to gauge if that's fine. You know, we look it up online and everyone's like, oh, that's normal. But our normal doesn't mean it's gonna be good. Right. So everything's a little bit of a red flag. <laughs> mm -hmm.